The thing that I value more than anything is three things. It is authenticity, it is transparency, and it is vulnerability. Appreciate you for being here. Let's get into the video. When you've taken a lot of hits in life, it can be really hard to trust. It can be really hard to not deliberately fuck up your life. When all you're used to is chaos, calamity, pain, violence, trauma, your nervous system is geared towards self-preservation and protection. And some of the times it happens in really dumb ways, or at least to like a logical person from the outside, it looks really stupid. My life, as I've spoken about many times, has been far from smooth sailing, as most of ours has. Add in undiagnosed, unmedicated, untreated neurodivergence, debilitating anxiety, a family history of alcohol, obesity, other substances, violence, miscommunication, family secrets, all the rest, you know, just the, all the rest of the bullshit. And it's a recipe for disaster. It's a recipe to not trust people. It is a perfect recipe to bake a cake of fuckery. Last night, I had a bit of an epiphany. I was doing some contemplation and I looked at my partner and I said, can you come here? I want to give you a big hug. And she came over and I gave her a big hug and I held her so tight. And then I said to her in her ear, I'm sorry. And I've apologized to her a bunch of times. And the reason why I said I'm sorry was because I have to wrestle with a part of myself pretty much every single day, even though I choose her and my family every single day to be the best version of me possible. There's times where I have a counseling session, a coaching session, a therapy session, or you know something for external eyes and experts, advice and strategies and stuff like that to come in to be able to help me provide better, be a better man. And that thing that I apologize for this time was I'm sorry if I've ever disrupted her. I'm sorry if I ever did anything or said anything to her that made her feel less than, apologized many times for that sort of stuff. And I feel like I continually need to show up better for that. When it came to last night and the root cause of why I apologized to her, it was because my life has known nothing but chaos. My life has only known pain, anguish, like I said before. And it's hard to trust someone who is as selfless and giving, kind, compassionate, caring, and secure as Rach is. Sure, she can be avoidant. However, she's been an anchor for me. The last nine and a half years that we've been together, she has, no matter how stormy my seas have gotten, she's been a safe space for me. She knows how to contain my crazy. She knows how to calm the storm that is inside of me. And that storm is, at times it's really fucking hard to deal with. I'm coming out the other side of burnout and I've said that a few times on a few of the you know smaller podcast episodes and pieces of content that I've done. And she has been the anchor, the thing that's like holding me here together and stable. Everything I am, everything I do is for her and the kids. It was really scary because I don't know if I would actually be here if it wasn't for her and the kids. It's hard to put so much trust into someone to be that stable place, especially when you've been burnt by so many females in the past especially when you've burnt so many females in the past, when you've gaslit them and you know made them think that they were crazy, but you're the one who's acting like a fuckwit and acting like a child and making them mother you, making them you know, look out for you, making them question their own sanity. Like that's who I used to be. And nine and a half years later, I still have to keep that part of me under control because there's times where I want to break and I want to fuck things up and I deliberately want to like burn the relationship down or, you know, like, go cheat or gamble. And like, I have to keep that impulse under control. Majority of the time, it's pretty easy. I look at my phone, I look through photos, 
memories, videos, and think, God, how lucky am I? And then there's harder times where my nervous system is so dysregulated and I want out because the chaos that's inside of me is eating me up alive from the inside and I need it to release. I need it to, I need it to get out of my body. That's why I train so fucking much. That's why I average four jujitsu sessions a week, three to four weight sessions a week. That's why I go for walks. That's why I meditate. Like I have so many coping mechanisms in place to be able to make sure that they don't feel the brunt of my crazy. I'm all for transparency and vulnerability and authenticity. It's something that I hold myself by. And so if you think that's me having a brand, doing the things that I do, helping people, you know, raise their consciousness, raise their awareness, become better humans, build a better life of success, love, fulfillment, all the rest of the things that I do, and I'm still this, this fractured and stuff like that, you don't understand healing. You don't understand authenticity and transparency because this is what it's about. I'm a human being. I'm just a little bit further ahead in my journey compared to some of you guys. And there's masters that are well, well further ahead than where I am. And that's kind of the point. Humanity as a collective, we're not getting out of this alone or alive. And we're definitely not getting out of it with this fucking helicopter going over top. Anyway, I would love for this year, being an election year in the United States, even though we're in Australia, that everything goes smooth, cool, calm, collected, but it's just not gonna happen. We need to recognize that we're all the same. Ultimately, we all want the very similar sort of things. Sure, there's gonna be outliers, there's gonna be extremes on all sides, but realistically, everyone wants balance. Everyone wants to be able to feel safe to send their kids to school, to know that they're not gonna get indoctrinated or in the States, they're not gonna get shot and killed To know that you can come home, you've got a roof over your head, cost of living's not too expensive, you can have purpose and meaning and friendship and socialization, have some entertainment, enjoy life, not just have it be suffering. But we can't do it alone. We have to do it together. I've said this so many times on here. Like, we need each other. We need each other so badly, it's not even funny. We need every single perspective to come together to be able to have conversation, communication, so that we can really nut out what are the acceptable paradigms of this new society that we're creating. Because you can look around, there's chaos everywhere. And this chaos is the start of a revolution. Whether we like it or not, whether people like to admit it or not, we're in the start of a revolution. Capitalism is corrupt. Government is corrupt. Markets are corrupt. People are corrupt. Religion, everything, every institution that has been established over the last 200 years is corrupt. And it's up to us as a society, as a collective, to be able to figure out what our new values are going to be. Nietzsche said it great. God is dead and we killed him. We're trying to live in a world, in the West at least, without Judeo-Christian presuppositions that underlined everything in the fabric of society where we had an implicit morality that was built into everything that we created. But because of the rationalist movement, because of the postmodern movement, the atheist movement, scientism, they've all become ideologies and they're all trying to replace humans with the divine of God. And I use that term not as the Christian God or as Allah or anything else. It's just God, like the big G, the eternal creator of all. It's not the man in the sky. <laughs> and if that's your level of thinking, you've got more learning to be able to do around anything to do with spiritual traditions. And I'm not saying that from a place of ego or authority or anything like that. I'm saying it from my own experience because I used to be an atheist. I used to have massive judgments and rejections around anything to do with religion. I'm like, these are just stories. These are just stories that some bunch of people put together in a book. And then there's some dude at the head of a church 
who earns way too much fucking money tax free that is leading people to some false promised land live as a pious one you can go to heaven do we have any evidence of that no that was my atheistic thinking I remember sitting there in religion in like grade four and I asked the I asked the person who was teaching us religion I said these are all stories these are all like metaphors because we were learning about metaphors in English and they're like oh well, not really like these are the words of God I'm like really I thought God was the father the the Holy Spirit I thought God was ephemeral not here that's this language now and they're like uh it's the word that was translated by people yeah so it's fallible it's stories it's metaphors it's guiding principles to be able to help people have some form of mythology some form of something anchoring them to the world something that is divine and bigger than humans because humans are fallible we're we're god we're moronic we're so we're just we are damaged broken somewhat evolved apes moving through life. But we need each other. But we also need something that's above and beyond and transcendent. One of the things that I've been wrestling with for so long, and it really added this extra layer into my life around the same time as my as long as probably back to my 2019 burnout where I started looking into Carl Jung more, Gnosticism, mysticism. I started looking into different forms of spirituality. I started reading different books and getting into all these different esoteric practices, uh, rituals and stuff like that to be able to figure out what's my spiritual place in this world. Because we live in a physical world, yes, but at the same time, like in our mind, in our hearts, in our contemplations, our meditations, in the unspoken things with one another, in the absolute oozy, juicy, just oh, beautiful stuff between man and woman, between people that are in infatuation. Infatuation is a beautiful thing when you can't get enough of one another. All of the, this is spiritual in nature. There's no, there's no tangibility about it. It's all, it's all beautiful. It's all ethereal. And so we live in two worlds. We live in a physical world, but we also live in this beautiful spiritual world as well. You know, making love, that's a spiritual practice. Going for a walk on the beach, that's a spiritual practice. Meditating, spiritual practice. Praying, spiritual practice. Either everything is spiritual or nothing spiritual. I think it's, I think the thing that I'm alluding to is we need to bring back in a mytho poetic worldview where we're understanding about our place in the physical world. But more importantly than that, we're all working through some form of abstract metaphorical symbology, symbology, symbolism, like there has to be something above, transcendent, something that is beyond this world because we're all beyond this world. Like the fact that we can go to sleep thinking we are who we are, there's hopefully an eight hour gap in between the time where you go to sleep and you wake up and you wake up thinking you're the same person. Like that's magic. The fact that we have a mind and unconscious, all these archetypes and other things that great minds of the past have thought about and spoken about and taught about, eludes to something. It's like the Tao. The Tao that can be named is not the eternal Tao. There's something beyond where we currently are. And we're, we're going back to what Nietzsche said about God being dead and we killed him. We remove the presuppositions. We remove the thing under the foundations of society. And look at it fucking mess. We all want the same thing. We all want to go home to our families. Like I said, we want to have purpose and meaning and love all of that great stuff, but we can't do it alone. One of the worst things you can do to a person is put them in solitary confinement. They lose their mind in months. It's the same thing as when you want to socialize a dog, you put them into a pack where the pack leader can sort them out, show them the right behavior, and then the rest of the pack sorts them out and shows them where they sit. That is completely natural. And yet when you isolate someone, they become psychotic, they become sociopathic, they become schizophrenic, paranoid, delusional. They start to turn inwards. They start to have all these different mental health problems, physical health problems, because you've deprived them of something natural. Deprived them of sunlight, depri deprived them of movement, like sunlight movement, that's medicine. And we're depriving people of that. That's like the worst 
if anything, cruel punishment that we can do. So we need to reintroduce people that are not doing so well. I'm not talking about criminals, but I'm talking about loners, outcasts, social pariahs and stuff like that. We need to introduce them into society so that we can all work together. It's the same way as having a, a dog coming into the pack. The pack determines what's up to scratch. We need to socialize them and show them what's okay. So the fact that we've got these opposing poles of people with my ideology, your ideology, and then we're just butting heads with one another, that's the opposite of what we need to do. It's like, okay, what's inside of your ideology without emotion that you believe that you have evidence around? Can we talk about this? What's your perspective? Oh, I want this thing because of this, this, and this, because it makes me, no, I don't want to feel, I don't want to hear feelings. I don't want to hear emotion. What's the logic behind your thing? And then once we've gotten through the abstraction of the logic down into the details, then maybe we can bring some anecdote and some feelings to it. Because feelings, emotions, anecdotes, they're not to be left out of the conversation, but they're not to drive the conversation either. I've been thinking long and hard this whole time that I've been burnt out, taking a break from socials about a psycho-spiritual worldview, psycho-spiritual alchemy in a mythopoetic worldview, which is big, stupid words to say that we need to focus on the other world, the intangible world, the spiritual world. And I'm not talking about spirituality as in new age woo-woo crap, Christianity, religion, anything like that. I'm talking about your own spiritual practices because we live in a physical world and a spiritual world. Your mind is that like your mind is spiritual in nature. It's not tangible. So therefore it is of the ethereal. It is of the ephemeral. It is of something otherworldly, like looking at dreams, looking at psychedelics, looking at breath work, meditation, hypnosis, all the other things that people demonize really quickly because they have no idea about it. And if anything, their lack of knowledge comes from a place of fear and judgment. When you expose yourself to paranormal psychology, to spirituality, breath work, meditation, hypnosis, ecstatic dance, like all these sorts of things, they open up a very intimidating worldview if you don't have those presuppositions enabled saying that there's this other thing. We need to bring it back into a place of prominence. That's why I talk so heavily about the straight and narrow path towards your North Star. If you know what your North Star is, you know you can aim towards it and any time that you come off track, there's something to be able to help buffer you as a boundary to say, no, you're going the wrong way. You'll know this when doors shut in your face, when opportunities get taken away from you, when things start going wrong, you know, fuck, I'm not on this right path. And you can reorient yourself towards that initial North Star. A couple of years ago, I thought that my North Star was leading me towards a job in uh, Queensland Corrections as a screw, as an officer. I was so excited for it. I did all the things, passed everything with flying colors, and they never got back to me. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, fuck, what's going on? Everything started really easily. You know, I was like, pass the fitness test. No worries. Pass the medical. No worries. Like everything was just so easy. And all of a sudden it was like, no, this is no longer your path. Door shut in my face. And I was left sitting on my ass going, what am I supposed to do? So I reoriented myself, got back into, you know, my business. And that's where the rise movement started and stuff like that. And look where we are now with this. Then I started going off track and thinking that NDIS work was going to be uh, going to be great for me but that turned into golden handcuffs for me and it started shutting doors for me. I was like, fuck, this is great, meaningful work. I'm making a lot of impact in the people that I'm working with and you know, working with autistic kids and stuff like that. And it was great. They looked up to me as a mentor. I helped them through a hell of a lot. And then all of a sudden doors started shutting in my face with that. I'm like, it's still available. I can still walk through that door, but it very much feels like golden handcuffs. Like I'm tired getting a great pay and making impact and stuff like that, but it's not what I'm here to do. So again, back towards my North Star, back towards, you know, teaching people and stuff like that. Started to notice that a lot more people, the moment that I stepped away from this and started focusing back on what, you know, the rise and movement and everything else was doing, all of a sudden people started showing up. Yeah, ah, cool. This is my straight and narrow path. It's self-orienting. Because I have a greater mythopoetic worldview, like looking at my tattoos, they all mean something for me. And it's a reflection for me to be able to go, ah, that's right. You're Mangunda, the Ouroboros, the cycle of death, birth, and rebirth. 
So Odin, he's the all father. He's the same archetype as Jesus Christ. He's the savior of those people. I'm not saying the savior. He's not the same as Jesus. He's the same archetype, the savior. Fun fact, the, I think it's the Prozetta and Jesus crucifixion, uh, very strangely similar. Odin hung himself from Yggdrasil, the world's tree, for nine days and nine nights, pierced with his spear, and he had to make a great sacrifice, ripping out one of his eyes to become the Allfather, to be able to read the runes and to know all things, to be able to starve off Ragnarok. Christ sacrificed on the cross, pierced with the spear. The water that spread out of him healed someone's sight. The water that Odin drank to be able to become the Allfather. There's a, there's a lot of synchronicities and similarities. That's where I'm going to leave that. When it comes to your own individual worldview, it's going to conflict. You're going to take great parts from certain lineages, but you're going to leave a lot out. There's a lot that I've left out from all of my learnings because I'm making my own. And my own works for me. It's not going to work for you. It's what Jung would call individuation. It's becoming who you're meant to be. It's ultimately creating an ego, refining your shadow, integrating your shadow, dissolving the ego into the self. I'm not saying getting rid of it because it's not bad. It's making conscious and unconscious whole, united and one, singular, where non-duality exists, where there's no unconscious contents anymore. To me, that sounds like enlightenment in Buddhist traditions, Zen traditions. It's Christ consciousness in Christianity. It's finding out your own path towards your version of spirituality, towards your version of worship, to, to have something above you that is above, above and transcended that is something that you can orient yourself towards, something that is admirable, something you, you can comfortably sit with, you can comfortably lead yourself with. I don't often think what would Odin do or what would, you know, I can't even remember what his name is. Anubis. I can't, what would Anubis do? What would Jesus do? I don't ask these sorts of questions. I ask, what's the highest version of me? What's my highest self? What would I do? What's the best version of me and the best decision moving forward? Because ultimately we all have a higher self. We all have a transcended self. And time being a construct consciousness being non-dual, non-local, you can have a conversation with yourself and imagine if you would, floating out to the end of this lifetime and having a conversation with old you and asking yourself for some advice because you are your best coach, mentor, because you know what you need to do. This is what it is to be in the spiritual world, to bring things from the spiritual world from other dimensions, realities, dreams, consciousness, whatever you want to do. If you want to journey with psychedelics, that's onto you, breath work, all the rest of the things, whatever you can grasp from the ether. And then you can bring into the mind, extrapolate it, contemplate it, and then integrate it into the physical world because the mind leads and the body obeys. In the Kabbalion, I don't know where it is, somewhere around in my office, the book, the Kabbalion, the seven hermetic principles, the first law, the first universal law is the all is mind. The universe is mental. Everything is mind. Everything is mental in nature. Everything we perceive is perceived mentally before we can interact with it physically. In the opening of the introduction of Think and Grow Rich, truly thoughts are things. Everything that you see around us that was created by man started with a thought. Someone thought about this microphone. Someone thought about that phone. Someone thought about absolutely everything inside of this house. Everything that is man-made started with a thought, made manifest through bringing it from the spiritual world into creation, into creation, integration, and then creation. Like we are godlike. We have unfathomable amounts of power to be able to think, feel, create. We're all creators. And that's what being creative is about. It's about birthing something into this world from the other side. Going back to my sleep token um, video, talking about individuation, talking about being on your straight and narrow path. It's about ascension. It's about the, 
the raising of consciousness because the more that you tap into the ether, spirituality, prayer, meditation, hypnosis, breath works, whatever, psychedelics, so on and so forth, you're pulling from the spiritual realm into the physical realm to make manifest. That's what manifestation is. The moment you can see it mentally, feel it emotionally in your body and understand that you're conditioning your body to be able to experience that thing, you'll create that thing. That's what manifestation is. It's super, super simple. We all overcomplicate it because we have all these implicit biases, these unconscious biases and beliefs and values. And, oh, I can't do that. Manifest manifestation's not real. Spirituality is false. All we have is materialist reductionist. That's all shit that's conditioned you into living a worldview that you might not like living. You can change. Neuroplasticity at the moment says that we're going to be able to change our mind, change our beliefs and our thought structures and behaviors and stuff like that well into our 60s. I guarantee you science is well behind what the body is capable of because this thing here, this meat suit, if you will, is one of the most amazing, complicated, magical fucking things in this universe. We are so powerful beyond belief. And going full circle back to the start of this podcast, talking about how I apologized to Rach for the chaos that I bring and thanking her for being the anchor you need that too. That's what the physical world is. Because if your mental, emotional, spiritual realm in your mind, in your soul is chaotic, you need someone to be able to help you calm those waters so that in the physical, it's not chaos. It's really important that you do that. So whether that's a partner, a parent, a therapist, a friend, a book, God, Allah, Whatever, whatever that you can do to bring your mind and body into peace that doesn't hurt anyone else, that doesn't take away from anyone else, that makes you a better person, that's what you need. Heal and become the best version of you possible. Heal and become the most powerful, loving, kind, compassionate version of you possible. There's an amazing life of love, success, gratitude, riches, experiences, but ultimately love on the other side of you getting out of your own way, out of you calming your waters and doing some shadow work, healing and integrating and becoming individuated, becoming the best version of you possible. I know what I'm here to do. I've worked so fucking hard on it for the last almost 10 years to be able to create this. So it's time we create a greater mythopoetic landscape, worldview, psychology, philosophy, all towards psycho-spiritual alchemy so we can manifest into the physical world. And if that's not gobbledygook, I don't know what is, but it's true. That's what we're here to do. Take from the mental, emotional, spiritual, make manifest into the physical. I think that's what humans are here to do. I think we are just creators, manifestors, not just human doings. We're human beings and human, human creatings. So that's enough of this rambling today. I really hope that this video, this message of psycho-spiritual alchemy, of a different, more robust, juicy, mythopoetic landscape lands home and I hope it meets the right people but until I see you again much love take care and follow me to rise higher you know what you need to do like comment share this around subscribe to the channel stay tuned for all of the awesome things coming out of rise because we're only just getting started thank you so much for being here watching another video much love take care and follow me to rise higher